You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Jack Luna, I'm absolutely delighted to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Good, man. I'm delighted to be here. I'm a huge fan of the Nighttime Podcast. Been been oh, one of your fans from the start, buddy. Thanks, man. With, without offending any of the, the more sensitive listeners, introduce yourself. Tell me a bit about you. I, without offending them, I have two kids. Um, I live in the middle of nowhere, Manitoba, and uh, have been interested in true crime my entire life. I used to be a social services worker. Uh, I drove a Zamboni for a while when I came out to live in Manitoba, and then I was listening to your podcast, listening to a few of the early ones, including True Murder with uh, Dan Sapansky. Nice. And uh, especially with that one, I was like, man, I could do this. With yours, I wasn't so much feeling that way, but with Sapansky, I was like, for sure, I could do this. <laughs> so I <laughs> I, uh, I gave it a shot, and now I've been doing it as like a, a kind of a full-time gig for the past two years three years in total tell us about your podcast what are you what are you doing now um i do a podcast called crime machine now and it's uh the type of well it's a it's a new breed of true crime podcast where i focus in on a particular moment in crime so they're well-known crimes that, for example let's say if it's btk then i would focus on maybe just the otero family murders section of it. So crime machine takes you in a time machine, but a crime machine, hello, <laughs> to a p- specific moment in crime. Crime machine, check it out. Yeah. People dig it. Uh, here's some. Here's a, a review from Apple Podcasts. And oh, I, no. This this isn't a good review, <laughs> but oh, it's good. like, oh, I, I think like this guy or girl who, or woman who wrote this review, they don't like it for all the reasons that I do. <laughs> what they say is, is this a true crime podcast or just some guy getting high and rambling about random <laughs> crap while attempting to tell a true crime story? <laughs> and I'm yeah, thinking like, it. yeah, I'm like, they, I don't think they're the target audience, but that's uh, that's pretty accurate. It is it is quite accurate. <laughs> Although that's that sounds more like dark topic uh, than anything yeah. else. I used I used to kind of implement like push myself into the story with my own personal experience and mm. uh, crime machine. I, I get away from that a little bit, but I kind of yeah. miss those days. Yeah, well, that's what I what I really dig about what you do. I've I've said that your show and your style. It's almost like if Jim Morrison hosted a true crime podcast. It's like it's poetic and it's really dark. And it I find as I'm listening to you, I just you know time just passes and all of a sudden I just feel like um I think you call it like a contact high where just all of a sudden I just don't quite feel myself. And it's something with the way you tell a story. That's high but, praise, saying Jim Morrison, yeah, Hunter S. Thompson, other people have said. But yeah, I remember <laughs> uh, when we first met, we were in uh, Toronto at that uh, crime, whatever it was. You know, we met up at the bar and we were talking in front of a group of people. And you, you introduced me and you're like, hey, I thought Jack Luna was like this genius writer, you know, in a smoky room. And then I met him and I'm very disappointed. Anyways, here he is, Jack Luna. I'm like, oh my God, what an introduction. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but regardless, like I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time and we've been talking about it for a bit, but it was just a matter of finding the right story to talk about and to tell. And I think we found something that's just like exactly what we've been looking for. It's dark, yeah. it's quirky, it's weird. It's fascinating as it is as much as it is tragic, I suppose. So before we get into it, why don't you set us up? Like, what about the story of Rocky Rambo caught your attention? Like, what drew you into this story without giving getting too far into it? You mentioned it to me first. I'm being completely honest. I was hip to it by by you, and I look into it and I see like this young kid who you know he doesn't seem like he, he could harm a fly just by looking at him, and um, the interrogation tape that we will talk about later there's a nine hour interrogation Mm -hmm. that you can watch and i watched quite a bit of it i was just really compelled to buy buy this person who was kind of slumped in his chair and giving really curt answers and not wanting to talk about it i was like man he did this this horrible stuff why is he called rocky rambo clearly we're not seeing rocky rambo right now Mm -hmm. but we will learn that he is uh you know much more vicious than he than he initially seems yeah. Well, I figure the best way to, to get through it is basically th- the way I see it is it's best for us to probably follow along from the point of the view of the investigators and basically tell the story that way. So the story will start 
on a September morning in 2017. We're in uh, an area of, of a residential area uh, of Vancouver. Again, September of 2017. It really, it all starts with a newspaper carrier walking down a tree-lined street. It's The area is called Marpole, which is kind of a lot of like larger, older homes, but it's a nice area. Uh, the newspaper carrier is basically walking down the street, and as he enters a home or, or the front yard of a home that he's delivered newspapers to for years, what he sees on the path, like the little walkway leading up to the um, up to the front door, is is a, on one side of it is a knife, and on the other side of it is a small axe. He didn't think anything of it and just delivered the paper. But that's kind of that's this moment in time is pinpointed as like kind of the first red flag in what's going to become a real horrific or horrible story. That newspaper carrier walks off, but shortly after, a guy by the name of Anthony Purcell, he shows up at the home where he's checking on a coworker. He's a, uh, he works as an occupational therapist, I believe, and one of his coworkers who was supposed to be at work that morning didn't show up. He's showing up at her home to see what's going on, and he walks past that same knife and that same hatchet, not noticing it goes to the front door and opens it to peek his head in to see if she's in there. And what he finds is basically the obvious signs of struggle. But more than that, he sees a kitchen with a floor that's just drenched in blood. Counters, cupboards, the whole thing is just splashed in blood. And that's when he uh, does the obvious thing and leaves the home and calls the police. And, and that's really, I guess, where from the investigator's point of view, where this all starts. Yeah, it's like the beginning of a horror movie, really. And this is, it is like a horror movie. It plays out that way in my mind. Um, I'd like, like to just interject here real quick and talk about the, the knife that's laying there. And we'll talk about this later, but it's like one of those, it's like a paring knife, you know? Uh, later on, it'll be described as a pocket knife, but it's like a, you know, you see it with like a kitchen set. Out here in Manitoba, where I live, it would be the type of thing I would use to like cut the rod off of all the bruised fruit they they leave for the people who live in Manitoba. Like it's 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 orange and you know so there's it's that that is there and then you got this hatchet covered in blood and uh, like you said blood everywhere in the house when when um, the coworker of we'll we'll learn her name soon but her name is Diana Ma Jones her home with her husband man go ahead yeah so. After this person calls the police, any horror basically in the kitchen is just nothing compared to what they find. It's we, we learn a lot about the police officer and the investigators kind of experience in the home because eventually when this case goes to trial, they'll take the stand and tell um, – a, a, a story that sounds pulled straight out of a horror movie. Basically, as they enter the home with their guns drawn because they don't know what they're walking into. There's blood all over the kitchen floor, all over the cupboards and counters, as I, as I already mentioned. They also see drag marks and bloody footprints, basically shines, signs showing that someone was dragged out of the kitchen and upstairs into the, you know, the second floor. As the police start walking up to the second floor to see what's going on, they can hear the sound of running water and the whole area is just full of steam, almost like walking up into a smoky room. It's just mm. very steamy. When they peek their head around the corner, they see the um, bathroom door open and you can they can hear that it's the shower running. Um, and obviously that's where the steam's coming from. But when they enter the bathroom and get a peek in the shower stall, what they see is uh, is the two bodies of the two elderly victims, the hot water running again, just basically feeding a steam bath that um, encompassed the second level story of the home, and right, uh, and and to say it's it's their their bodies without even getting into the results of the autopsy or, or what they found. It was um, the male, the deceased male, Ma Jones's husband. He had 103 stab wounds, uh, alongside hatchet wounds to the throat. Uh, and Ma Jones similarly was um, gravely injured. She was deceased with a, a wound to her neck. Basically, right. her throat had been sliced. So we're we're talking about like an absolutely barbaric, brutal murder. Yeah, a murder that I actually had a, a nightmare about a couple of days ago. <clears throat> so Diana Ma Jones, sixty five, and Richard Jones, her husband, he used a walker to get around. Uh, sixty eight years old. After learning about this, I um, was, you know, I had a nightmare about it, man. And 
here's what it was. It was about the situation you just described, but I was like an investigator and I was walking up and I could hear the water running and there was the steam as you, as you mentioned. And I come in and that shower stall is full of water and there's two bodies bobbing in it. And it was like the killer had flex sealed the, uh, every, the, the seals and made it into like a Harry Houdini dunk tank and, and the bodies were floating in it, man. I had I had that nightmare. Jesus. Like, what a horrific scene in general, just the way it was. I could see why the vision would stick with you because it's it's such a, it's such a visual kind of thing. Like, I I picture like this the steam and all that, and what the investigators must have been thinking when they Ugh. found this. And it, it's absolutely brutal. And at the time, it was a mystery. They had no idea who did this. There was no evidence to suggest a robbery. However, the the one kind of glaring clue was that her the, their vehicle was missing um and as almost as soon as this leaked in the press that this double murder had happened in this in this area at the same time also along with those articles was photos of the vehicle basically saying like if you could see this if you find this vehicle you know let us know and that's really how it started was the investigation was we found these two deceased people and their vehicles missing um along along with those articles as the press does you know every couple hours a new article would come up with a new you know a new paragraph about about the victims but we learned uh, quite a bit about them in the days after their bodies being found again 65 year old diana maude jones and her her husband richard 68 I've seen him referred to as disabled mm -hmm. in several articles, but I've never seen described w what was what his story was, other than he used a walker to get around and, and wasn't employed. But as a 68 year old man, uh, that's that doesn't seem out of the ordinary. But maybe there's there's more to it. But with with the female Diana Ma Jones, she was still working very active. She was an occupational therapist and a well respected one. She'd worked with the health authority for 35 years and was basically seen as a bit of a rock star in her industry. She's received all sorts of awards, was known for being able to basically like improvise and almost like design equipment on the go or on the fly in her job. She was like kind of like a bit of a wizard with this stuff. And if you Google her name, you'll find articles about her, about the crime that ended her life, but you'll also find articles during her life, basically applauding her role as a as an occupational therapist. So it was definitely somebody who was successful and active in the community that was just plucked from existence due to this, you know, horrible crime. But um, yeah. the early news stories are, are really, really troubling as as you kind of see this unfold. Definitely. Like you said, he was, uh, he had a walker. He was a retired guy, I, I assume. I couldn't even find what his occupation was. No, uh, I, I couldn't find much about him. It was always about, about her. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, she was, you know, she, she was coming up with inventions for her clients. And I'm sure you get into that. I mean, I could right now, there was uh, like a latex collar that she developed for a woman with muscular dystrophy and she had a wooden pulley operated feeding tower for a man that needed to eat while standing. Like she, she was not just occupational therapist, not going through the motions. She was, you know, actively trying to invent things to, to make life easier for her clients. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was just like, if you're a master of that trade or that craft, that's kind of mm -hmm. what it would turn into. So mm -hmm. she, she did it her whole life and she was good at it and uber reliable. And I think that's why the gentleman showed up at the home to check on her when she didn't show up for work. I don't know if he called her house and couldn't get her or whatever, but her not showing up at work was enough to justify going there and checking on her. And that kind of says something like if I didn't show yeah. up somewhere, I may get a text, <laughs> right. but I don't think anyone's coming to my house. Right. No, I, if, if I disappeared, I'd be dead for 15 days in my studio. They, well, I have kids, so maybe they come and check on me, right? But I mean, it's not the same. I, I, if I went back to like my working days when, when I didn't have kids and all that and people that relied on me, definitely no one would check on me right away. So yeah, no, it does say something because it, her coworker came and checked on her fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was the next, it was... It wasn't even like the afternoon. I think it was the morning that he showed yeah. up to, to look at, to look in on her. But uh, regardless, very quickly after word spread that we're looking for the vehicle, the vehicle was found. 
but not much was said publicly about what that pointed to as far as an investigation goes. However, behind the scenes, a suspect was identified around this time. We'll only learn about this when the case eventually goes to trial, but I guess following the narrative we're telling, it would make sense to tell this story now, but basically... Uh, a young Asian male was identified as a suspect as a result of a purchase he made in Canadian Tire shortly before the the murders. He basically purchased a, a very specific hat. I think it says Canada on it and has a maple leaf. He, he bought a pair of gloves and a hatchet. Coincidentally, that same hat was found with blood on it under the kitchen table. And that hatchet that was purchased, the same kind of make and model or whatever, was found on the front lawn. So it was pretty obvious that this Asian man buying this stuff uh, was connected to the to the crime. At least if he wasn't, it would be a huge coincidence. When you see pictures of the hat, it's it's not uh, a typical hat you would see somewhere. Right. Um, so anyway, that was – it wasn't the kind of thing where they put it out in the press like with photos of him, like we're looking for this guy. This all seemed to be happening behind the scenes that the police were collecting CCTV video from you know, Canadian Tire in this case, but all over the place. And by the time they find the who they suspect to be the young man making that purchase in Canadian Tire, they already have CCTV video of basically – everything that happened outside of the home with the drop off of the vehicle and everything else. So I guess what comes next in the story is we're going to get to the arrests. Some sense of relief in Marpol now that a suspect is behind bars. 25 year old Rocky Rambo Wei Nam Cam now charged with second-degree murder in the deaths of Diana Ma Jones and Richard Jones. The couple in their 60s killed six weeks ago in their home on 64th near Hudson. A police source says a hatchet was found on the lawn, and what was found inside had never been seen by first responders who needed help to cope with what they witnessed. The motive of the double murder, we still don't know. Uh, Cam is a Canadian citizen who was born in Hong Kong, and he had immigrated to Canada with his family as a teenager. Um, in Hong Kong, he had trouble in elementary school and developed little in the way of a, a social life. He, a thing to note here, and this will become important later, is that he began gaming at a young age, kind of escaping from mm -hmm. his trouble socially into the world of gaming. Yeah, and he... Um his family, it seems like he was kind of raised in a family where I'm, I'm expecting, I don't know for sure, but I don't believe his parents were around a lot. His dad apparently was an engineer who was never really around. And his mother was an, worked as both an accountant and as a teacher. And in the interrogation, we hear Rocky Rambo describe his family. Um, and he didn't have much much positive things to say about either of his parents. He didn't even know what kind of engineer his dad was. And he described his mom as fake. And basically when the investigator or the interrogator pushed him on it, what do you mean by fake? He basically summed it up with like, she wanted me to do things that I didn't agree with. Yeah. <laughs> so his, I, like, I guess reading between the lines, I can tell he didn't seem to have a good home life. And I guess maybe that makes sense why he retreated in video games he had um, he had some siblings. He was um, he was the middle of th middle child of three, and at one point he'd live with his brother in Calgary. And it was at that point he was educated. Rocky Rambo has a degree in economics from the University of Calgary. Um, however, I'm kind of surprised he passed because what I've learned and what I've read about his time in Calgary and his time in university was that was really when his interest in video games and kind of his second life within the world of the video games right. that he was interested in really intensified. He was apparently spending uh, 10 to 14 hours a day playing video games, which is which right. is pretty intense. Yeah, that's um, all day. It, yeah, and, and that'll become, like, as we get through deeper into the story, video games will keep coming up. And that's kind of why, why I'm talking about it now, just so people can kind of follow along with it. But basically, to put it in perspective here, as far as the timeline, Rocky Rambo, he moved from 
Calgary, where he was living near his brother, to Vancouver only three months prior to these killings. And he had no real reason to even be in Vancouver. It's, it's. I think that I caught a reason in watching that long interrogation tape was that maybe a small reason was that in Calgary, he didn't have a vehicle. And in Vancouver, you can walk around. He says this at one point. You can walk around and get pretty much whatever you need, and they have a better bus system. It just was like a more convenient place, uh, an easier place to live. You'll find this with Rocky, Rambo, which I should say right now. I don't believe that that was his legal – he didn't make that his legal name. It's kind of like – I have a neighbor from the Philippines, and when I introduced myself to him, he said his name was Fred. And I was like, dude, there's no way your name's Fred. I call him Mr. Flintstone now. We're buddies, right? And I read that as well. But I've also read that his dad was a huge Sylvester Stallone fan uh, and gave him that name. What's your date of birth, Rocky? 1992, August 2nd. Okay, and your full name, Rocky Rambo Way Nam Cam. Yes. Yeah, you're laughing. Why are you laughing? I don't like that. <laughs> oh. You don't like all of the names or some of the names? Rocky Rambo. Do you know Rocky Rambo? Well, I, yeah, I know a Rocky Rambo, yeah. You look like a Rocky Rambo, do you? Not much, no. No. <laughs> Is that the, the, but that's obviously the name that your parents gave you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, what we do know for sure is that he had an incredible interest in video games that was all consuming and that he had no real ties to Vancouver, be it friends or family, at the time that this uh, this crime occurred and that he's uh, accused of being uh, involved in it. And that's really where we're at when we get to the interrogation. And the interrogation, you've already mentioned it, it's a nine hour long interrogation that is at times very hard to watch because I feel like Rocky Rambo maintained composure where the interrogator didn't. The interrogator seemed seemed like sincerely upset. She was grilling him and was all over him. If anything, he was just kind of annoyed by her, but she seemed like she was kind of losing her cool more than once where in the initial interrogation, he denied any involvement, denied having ever seen them, denied ever knowing them, despite the fact that She's the interrogators presenting him with evidence, basically saying, we have your DNA on the scene. Her blood is on your glasses and on on Rocky's glasses. So they had there's there's no question. I think she told him there's a one in six hundred and fifty million chance that it isn't you. (laughs) And that Uh was there. Yeah. And he he denied it. But. Anyway, what were your thoughts? Because I, I know you watched sure. a lot of the interrogation. Yeah, well, I'll go back a little bit here on this uh, because with the surveillance tape from the Canadian Tire, watching his movements um, within that when I was a kid, because I would steal when I was like, you know, I don't know, 10 years old, 12 years old. And if you steal something, you kind of walk around too long and you're probably going to get caught because you're like a little bit nervous. That's the way he was walking around. It was very childish. And he's picking up a hatchet, some gloves, and a hat. It's like, okay, come on, Rocky, what else you got? You got a, you got a shovel, a three-hole balaclava? Mm-hmm. Like, like it's it's really crazy what, what he's picking up. It's He's very immature. And so to, to answer your question, when it came to the interrogation, what I took from him was this. You remember with uh, Making a Murderer, Stephen Avery's uh, parent co-conspirator, uh, what was his, his name was like Brendan? Dacey, he, Brendan Dassey. Thank you. So he reminds yeah. me of Brendan. Remember when Brendan says, Mom, am I going to be home for WrestleMania next weekend? You know, <laughs> after he admitted to, yeah. <laughs> to murder. Um, he struck me as like that type. He doesn't really understand the enormity of the situation that he's involved in. He strikes me as the type of kid that his mom still needs to tell him to brush his teeth and he just wets his toothbrush to, to appease her when she goes to check. Like he, he's, he's very innocent seeming. Um, and he... And to, to your point, I didn't feel like the interrogator, she was trying to build rapport with him, but really wasn't getting to his level. Um, she was more not like at, not at all. mothering yeah. him. And that's a turnoff for a guy like this who has already said he felt his mother was fake, right? She was really cl- making him clam, clam up. And he continues to say, I don't want to talk about it, you know, over and over again. We're talking about a nine hour interrogation. And the guy for the main part, the only thing he says is he, he wouldn't mind having a chicken sandwich when she brings it up, right? One thing he did talk about, which surprised me is, well, for one, like the things that surprised me about it was 
when he did talk, he laughed at the end of like yes. every sentence. But it wasn't it wasn't really this like maniacal laughter. It was more just kind of this nervous energy he had. He seemed really like awkward and shy and 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 he was almost like trying to be like polite and pleasant with her, but and he was trying to explain to her, like, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. And then she would drill harder. But what he did say, he said something like, I, I guess I just would want to play video games like uh, or apps on my phone. <laughs> well, um, what else are you worried about there at the house? I don't think anyone would like <laughs> someone stress your room, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's not very pleasant. Is there any reason why we'll find anything in your house um, with regard to these people? No, I don't think so. No. That I could be sure. Okay. I can see that gives you some stress, Rocky. Oh, of course it is. That. Can I relieve that stress for you at all? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. If, well, if there's Ray, don't search my room, but you surely could, wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, they're going to do that, I'm afraid. So? They, they are. So good. what? <laughs> but, um,. I don't know, sometimes we can alleviate stress. Sometimes people have pets or they have letters they want to go off to certain people or they want to save certain things for certain people. And so, uh, you know, if there is any... Yeah, that's the way to relieve my stress. Give me my phone. <laughs> you want your phone? I want, I, want, I want to play video games, play apps. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure about I, that. I, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I, I'm sure you, you wouldn't, wouldn't do it, but <laughs> I just have a, I need to do something in the game, on that game, oh. so with my friends. So. It, his mindset, I can't imagine what he was thinking. It's, it's, it's one of the things that make this case so bizarre. I took the, the for people who are interested, I have the full interrogation video, and I'm gonna, I kind of remastered the audio so you can really hear it well. I'm gonna put it up on my YouTube for anyone who wants to listen. It's, it's tough to get through, yeah. but I, I, I find it fascinating to skim through it and just kind of see how it evolves. And again, her, her, like you said, her approach I think was way off. I, if I met him, I feel like within a couple minutes. I would realize what kind of approach I'd have to take, oh, yeah. and it would have been. I don't know why they didn't give him a phone or something and sure, get him comfortable. Sure, calm him down and, a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I think he w he was telling them what he needed yeah. to be won over, and it was like they wanted nothing to do with it because it was unconventional to stoop down to the level of like you know a millennial wanting to play a video they game sort but of thing. Like you just said, though, I think they should have. I mean, I worked in schools where you would get kids who can't focus, and if you talk to them directly. You might as well have like one of those uh, from the old detective movies in a smoking smoky room with a light bulb hanging above their head, like it's an like this is an interrogation, but like they clamp they mm -hmm. clamp up. So speaking to like just kind of kids in schools that I've dealt with, and what you need to do is kind of distract them with something they enjoy, and then you know interject and you kind of tease it out of them. There was really none of that going on. I mean, the offer was for a chicken sandwich, and he kind of laughed that off. He was like, "This is you know, what what are you gonna?" You're not going to get anything out of me for a chicken sandwich, lady. Yeah, it was a complete waste of time because they really didn't get much of uh, much out of him. But um, anyway, at the point that he's he's arrested, uh, as you said, it was initially with two counts of second degree murder. Um, the the public would know very shortly after that things were even worse than they seemed initially. His charges uh, before it went to trial uh, were upgraded to first degree murder. We learned during the trial while that why that happened basically the um, prosecution felt that he prepared for the attack far in advance and i think it was due to internet searches apparently when they searched his home or his apartment and went through his stuff uh on his internet history he had searched uh, uh google searches related to crime scene cleanup tasers drug what drugs would knock people out <laughs> yeah. so it would basically it looked like he was planning something mm -hmm. his his defense was that these searches were related to comic books that he was he was reading yeah it's pretty and weak. again that's yeah, a pretty weak defense i don't know a lot of comic books that get into this although i know comic books get pretty dark but it just seems pretty convenient that he was searching this stuff 
randomly bought a, a knife and a hatchet for no apparent reason and then had his blood on a crime scene. Like it's, uh, There's no question that this is a slam dunk case against him, but ultimately what the trial and what the whole case is going to hinge on is the defense's case is basically that his obsession with video games was so intense that he actually thought he was in a video game and was suffering some kind of mental disorder at the time of the murder that basically detached him from reality and let it let him kind of act the way he would in a video game which right. is a pretty pretty unique defense it is and it's extremely unique or or um uh like they're really reaching here when it, when you watch the interrogation tapes this nine hour thing he doesn't mention that once when the, when she's asking him what why did you do this why you know, it could have been pretty easy for him to say right there. I don't even, I don't know how to, like, they keep on saying that he doesn't show any remorse for what he did. That's fine if you're going to go with, with this uh, defense. Um, but if, if, if I murdered two people and I don't have any recollection of it and I'm thinking maybe I was in this gaming consciousness, I would still feel some remorse that I, two people are dead and at my hands, you know, and he never, he never, speaks about thinking he was in Skyrim or these other games that he talks about later on here. Yeah, and and it gets pretty weird in the trial when it gets into the gaming stuff. So basically in in the opening statement, so when the trial begins, of course he he's pled not guilty to the two counts of first degree murder. The the crown basically starts the whole thing off promising that they will prove that the hatchet and the knife found at the scene were used by him to kill the couple. That his DNA was found under the, the female, Diana Ma Jones' fingernails, and that her DNA was found on his glasses. So, you know, if those things, if they can prove that, that's a pretty good, a pretty good case. Um, they also claim that the crimes were premeditated for the reason that I described those internet searches, but also because he bought the weapons well in advance and that he actually when they piece together kind of the timeline that of what happened using all the CCTV footage that they got, it appeared that he was in the house in hiding when they arrived, which again is a sign of premeditation. So the crown's belief is that his motive quite simply is that he wanted to experience killing someone. And they claim that in their case, they're going to be able to prove that. And, and that's really where the, where the trial starts. Now, the, the kind of the evidence, the way they presented it was in sections. And I think it was a really good argument uh, to support their case the way they presented it. They start with the DNA evidence against him, which again, they mentioned in their opening statements and I just uh, alluded to there is that Cam's DNA was found on one of the knives, which was the knife that was purchased at Canadian Tire. So it already that connects him with the purchase at Canadian Tire and the crime scene. There's a 600 and 630 quintillion chance that it's anyone else's DNA. Ma Jones, Diana Ma Jones, her blood that was found on his sun, on his glasses that he wore, it was actually on the inside hinge. So uh, there must have been a lot of blood on the glasses and he probably washed it off but left, um, left that part within the hinge. Uh, uh, Rocky Rambo's DNA was found under her fingernails. Again, she was left in the bathtub with hot water blasting on her for a couple hours underneath. So her body was likely washed of a lot of the residue that was left behind. But under her fingernails, um, she had Rocky Rambo's DNA. And people who spoke to the press said she was a pretty, like she may have been 65, but she was tough and feisty. They say she wouldn't have went down without a fight, and so she likely got a good claw or scratch in on him. But oh yeah, she definitely did. She, she was she was strong. Like she came back from a dance class that night when she came home. She besides being involved with like it's a physical job that she's doing as an occupational therapist, but she she was in shape and obviously she fought for her life. Yeah, and regardless, like that that DNA, like when you think of a, a of a trial when it's a you know like a killing someone with your bare hands like you're expecting to see dna evidence used and, and when there isn't any it's almost like it creates doubt in this case like not only was the dna evidence used but it was like it kind of tied the whole thing together because it includes the purchase at canadian tire and it connects you know it, it connects them all together so it's very solid they back it up 
and create their timeline with all the video evidence. So again, the the investigation early on, it, like what they must have done was just scoured the neighborhood and its businesses and got every bit of CCTV footage. What they present in court during this trial is almost like a almost like a scrapbook of little pieces of video that show every aspect of it. I'll just kind of walk through what they what they displayed in the in, during the trial, and, and you jump in if you need to, or or if you, if you have anything you want to add. But basically, the night of the murders, the video starts with um, a man they believe to be Rocky Rambo. This is just before six o'clock. He's be, he's basically roaming around the streets. So they see him just crossing random random intersections. I think it was. Um, video from buses i guess buses have cameras so it's just random short clips of him just like walking around next video is uh mr jones uh using his walker in a liquor store this is about 6 15. um shortly after about 15 minutes later he's walking from the liquor store towards his home so we see the video of that him and he is an old fragile man very slowly and carefully making his way down the road Next, we see uh, about about a half hour later, Diana Ma Jones. Uh, she's leaving her dance class. About a half hour after that, she's at a Costco. It's now 7.30. Next, we bounce back to Rocky Rambo walking. Again, a bus catches him. He's walking very near this house, the house where the crime took place at about 8 o'clock. So about a half hour after she was at Costco. The next video is about a half hour after that it's now 8 38 p.m and basically we see a white vehicle pull up and stop on the side of a street and a guy get out of the street and walk off and that's their vehicle and they believe that's rocky rambo walking away so when you look at right. all of these kind of clips uh, in order basically we see them going about their day him roaming around aimlessly when the time in following the timeline, she would be showing up after he was in that area. So it's likely that he got inside the home, was alone with the disabled 68 year old Richard Jones, likely ended her life and I'm his life. And I'm thinking she probably walked in as that was happening or after it went down. Okay. That's that's kind of the way yeah. I see that. The way I see that going. Yeah, that that's strange to me because that's how the crown is presenting it, and I understand why you're saying that as well. But we'll get into it a little bit later on. But he doesn't claim that's the way it went down. Mm -hmm. He says that he came across her as she was unloading her groceries, and then kind of like followed her into the house, is the way that I understood it, and and uh, murdered her with a slice across the throat once she got inside, and then heard her husband coming, hid, and stabbed him multiple times. Here's what I. Th if I, I, I stop me if I'm getting ahead here, Jordan. The only thing is, um, we should just say is that during the interrogation, he denied any involvement. However, in the trial, he'll take the stand and tell and tell the whole story. And and this is his version that you're describing now. Perfect. So yeah, I, he to to go along with what I'm saying here is the way I see it, he's roaming around. He might have spotted her previously in my mind. Some of this video footage, not only from buses, but from houses that have security footage too. So we see uh, Rocky Rambo kind of walking around the area leading up to this. I believe from what he says later on in trial and what you just spoke about, I think is what they were assuming before he, before he went to trial. I'm not sure about that, but I believe he came across her, saw her as a really good potential victim and pushed her into the house and and murdered her and her husband. She is of uh, Asian descent as well, right? Yes. And m there's a thought that it's possible that she reminded him of his own mother, who he's described before as fake, and uh, kind of set him off. He was fantasizing, obviously, to this point, and he took advantage of an opportune situation. But continue we'll we'll get into the trial and, and we, we will talk about all that i'm sure yeah well well really it's like what we see here is two rival stories so his mm -hmm. defense like will eventually put him on the stand and he will bluntly and flatly tell his story the 
prosecutors believe it was this premeditated attack. He was in the home before they showed up and, you know, and did these right. things where his version and the defense's version is is a different story. So I don't know, like the truth is going to be somewhere somewhere in the middle. So there's there's two competing theories. One is him having a premeditated plan and the other is, you know, is 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 his story. Now, people hearing this and thinking about him addicted to video games and having the senseless, brutal murder would think the, the, there could be chances of, you know, mental illness being at play. The trial was actually stopped for several months before he took the stand to allow a, a, a full mental fitness kind of examination to happen. Not much kind of came out of it. They basically... Uh, Rocky Rambo's uh, representation requested a delay in the trial to to do these kind of tests or whatever it is they they went about doing on him, and then after a period of time, the the case just ended up back in the court with him being you know on the stand and in hearing his confession. Rocky Rambo Wayne Nam Cam was soft spoken. He appeared unemotional. His evidence a matter of fact. Cam told the court he was walking down the street September 26, 2017, when he saw Diana Ma Jones taking groceries out of her car. He said he pulled out his hatchet and a pocket knife while hiding behind a tree. I ran to the door. I believe she tried to close the door, but then I tried to bust my way in using force. As soon as Mr. Jones walked into kitchen, I stab him. I just keep stabbing him. It goes on for a while thought in my head, how come he didn't die? When he tried to stand up, I'm not sure if I stab him or push him to floor. Go to living room, pick up hatchet. I use hatchet and chopped him on the neck. Cam admitted he bought a hatchet and other items from Canadian Tire, but he's unclear why. After dragging Ma Jones to the kitchen where her husband was, Cam said he tied the legs of both victims to a chair. Again, he can't explain why. After cutting the twine, Cam testified he dragged the couple to the bathroom and put the bodies in the shower stall. After the killings, Cam told the court he was thirsty. He opened up the fridge, drank some milk and ate a peach. He grabbed $30, keys, a wallet and some bananas before leaving. Cam drove off in a car, went home and had a shower. He dumped his bloody clothes and shoes in the garbage bin behind his house on Granville Street. I think he's telling the truth on how this all went about, and I don't see how this happen, how this helps him anyway. Maybe the defense is thinking, you know what, he, he gets triggered, and he goes into this gaming consciousness mode where he doesn't know what's going on, he follows her into the house, and all these things happen. That's the only thing I can see. The reason I believe he's already killed them both, and he drags them, or at least they're very close to death at this point, drags them to chairs and ties, them, ties their legs to, to a chair, and actually couldn't explain. I think probably, in my mind, what it is is that he had a plan this fantasy was a plan that was part of the fantasy and it kind of went out of order and his plan at some point was to have them tied to a chair so he did it but it didn't fit at that point it was unnecessary so he untied them that's what happens in, in my head like uh, these guys always have a fantasy and of course this hasn't all played out and we'll never really know the truth from this guy because he can you know he, he won't give you anything in this nine hour interrogation all talks about as a chicken sandwich <clears throat> it, it's it's hard to but in my mind it was part of the fantasy that he wanted to implement whether it was in order or not that's all i can see that makes sense uh, i yeah i could see that regardless he he takes him to the shower leaves him there but he does something odd before he leaves and i know you have something to say why don't you talk about after he lays their body in the shower before he leaves the home he goes to the kitchen and he tells the story on the stand and he basically eats a bunch of their food. Yeah, he sits down. He says he's like super thirsty. So he drinks a glass of milk and he eats a peach uh, before leaving the crime scene. And this rang a bell with me because uh, BTK would do this after after murdering people. Um, I believe, well, there's quite a few people that, that did this. Uh, serial killers, murderers that, that talk about sitting down and, and drinking and eating out of their fridge. Um, Joseph D'Angelo, the, um, the Golden State Killer, uh, many names, right? The, the original Night Stalker being the main one, would do the same thing. 
Um, and the besides it, for for a guy like BTK, it became part of his ritual. He would even offer, I think he believed uh, Nancy Fox, he offered her a glass of water beforehand. But the reason why, when you look into it, is like when you have an adrenaline rush, your uh, saliva glands shut off and you start breathing out of your mouth. It's natural for a human being to breathe out of your nose. You're supposed to breathe through your nose. You start when this adrenal you know, kick, you're breathing out of your mouth and it makes your throat dry and your, your saliva glands aren't working. It's all pushing towards adrenaline and you're super thirsty afterwards. And, you know, that is, uh, that's probably what happened with him here. That's why he sat down and had a glass of uh, milk, super thirsty because of the, the extreme situation he had just been through. Yeah, when you hear him like drinking milk and eating a banana and a peach, and I think he took thirty dollars for some reason before he left in their car. Yeah, w- when you hear that, it sounds so bizarre, but at the same time, I can almost picture him just like absolutely gasping for breath, like he's been sitting in this crappy apartment playing video games for you know the last yeah. several years. He definitely wasn't yeah. in the condition to be dragging people around. No. And again, I'll, go, I'll go back to this. This this play, what you just said right there, plays into my my opinion that his story is true, that he wasn't in the house when she came in. I believe he took care of the uh, stronger one first, which would be Diana Ma Jones, because her injuries are just a big slice across the throat and a carotid ar- artery being um, sliced, right? Mm-hmm. So she's kind of out right away, and then he easily takes over um, Richard Jones is in a walker and he stabs him 103 times. He's, he's an easy target because of what they say is that he has a disability, I guess. That really plays to me as, as the true way that this went down. Hmm. Because if he's waiting in the house, he's got a one-on-one battle with this, with, um, with Diana. I, I think that he's at a disadvantage face-to-face at the door. If he follows into the house, he's got her back and he slices her throat and he's on top. Hmm. He, like I think people were surprised that he took the stand, he, that he like he went and allowed himself to tell the story because it comes across as brutal uh, and very cold hearing him tell. But it's a part of the defense's plan where they basically want to show him as being this kind of like socially awkward, isolated kind of guy who did like kind of a pointless crime that made no sense. And they get into then explaining their theory, which is you, – you've said it a few times is they, they created almost a mental illness uh, referred to – they came up with something called gaming conscience, which is basically when you think you're in a game and are – a video game and are basically acting out – a, a fantasy is con- disconnected from reality. Defense counsel Glenn Orris told the court Cam suffered from a mental disorder at the time of the killings. He thought he was in a video game and within the game he attacked and killed the couple. Defense says Cam has no prior history of violence. I believe the evidence will show no motive, no prior connection between Cam and the victims. He's unable to explain why he did these acts. There does not appear to be logical explanations for what he did in the house outside of a game. Cam, who has an economics degree from Calgary, said at one point he was gaming 12 to 13 hours a day. I was reading a lot of the articles thinking, like, I don't know a lot about psychology or whatever. I thought gaming conscious must have been, like, something. But apparently, yeah, it was like they they even asked him, like, (laughs) is this, like, a condition? And the doctor, the doctor's like, no, no, these are just, like, my own words. Like, he, yeah, it's not something that's studied or or exists. That's just the the term they gave for (laughs) Rocky Rambo thinking he's in a video game and, they, uh-huh. they, and this really bothered they, me. They, they made it up. Yeah, they they basically made it up. And they, um, the video game he was playing a lot was Skyrim. And I, oddly, like I'm not a big gamer or anything, but one game I played for hours and hours is Skyrim, and that is I played it too. Yeah, that's not a violent video game. It's 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 violent oh. like Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings. Let me ask you this, mm. uh, Jordan. Do you remember a part in Skyrim where? You tie people to a chair? No, not necessarily. I don't recall. <laughs> no. Well, that was part of his deal, right? If he's in a game and he's tying people to a chair and it's a big part of his fantasy, where's he getting that oh, from? Oh, okay. I mean, you're because you're saying because that doesn't happen in the game. 
No, and yeah. it's something on his own. It's, it's his own deal. Okay, you I know, like this. This is a mur murder. I was, that happened. I was waiting for you to tell me about some subplot I don't remember from Skyrim that like mirrors <laughs> this crime. I was gonna think I would yeah. have been shocked because the the game is more about exploring these like you know abandoned ruins and fighting skeletons that are you know have that are hiding or that are cursed to guard this treasure. Yeah. You know, and what they did exactly. at one one point. Now I. I wish I could see video of this. Like I've only read about it, but his lawyer um, show uh, demonstrated Skyrim. So his lawyer basically is playing a video game on a TV in the courtroom, showing people like how violent Skyrim is. And the lawyer is just like going around, like attacking people. And, you know, when you play a game yeah. like Skyrim, like these kind of role playing games, you can kind of roam around cities and interact with people and, you know, and uncover these little side quests and secrets. But you can also like pull out your sword and like hit them. <laughs> and then, you know, all the people in the town will attack you. And it's just like it's this this dumb thing. But he was kind of uh, showing that it's this violent game where you can just attack people. And then he, he asked, like, Rocky to describe what he was doing. And Rocky basically said, like, you know, you had a hard time killing that person because your character wasn't leveled up and didn't have strong weapons. And it just seems like, uh, like, thinking about it, it must have been just such a bizarre scene to play out in the courtroom. You know what I was wondering when I saw, well, when I heard about all this, I'm like, well, it's too bad he wasn't into Mario Brothers because all he'd have was like a sore head from banging his head off bricks, hoping a mushroom would fall out, you know, or jumping off of rooftops and grabbing on the flagpoles to make the level end. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, there. I don't put much, like, I, when I think of this, this well, well, we'll get with our, our thoughts on the case. Basically, in in the end, after they present their case that he thought he was in a video game, when questioned why during the interrogation did n none of this stuff came up, their their answer to that is he thought he was in a video game and had this game in conscience during the interrogation as well. And that's why he oh. acted the way he did in that because that's, oh. that's a big kind of problem with the theory that he thought he was in a game. Why would he then during the interrogation, you know, be be the way he was? But yeah. The the thing with the gaming consciousness thing as well is I think I believe that the judge and everybody feels the same way that we do. It's it's ridiculous, but yeah. they had to accept it. In my opinion, uh, well, and other people's opinion as well. From what I read, is that you have to accept it because if you don't, then later on it could be grounds for an appeal where you could get mm -hmm. a new trial with that implemented, right? So you don't want to give them a second chance. So let's get this stupid theory out of the way and and knock it out, you know, smash it to the ground uh, right now so that it doesn't come back to haunt us later in the court system. Mm -hmm. So upon cross-examination, when the, when the crown goes after him, they're basically asking him, if you didn't plan to kill someone, why were you roaming around with a hatchet, two knives, a glove, and a baseball bat? They, they asked him that on the stand, and his response was he kind of chuckled, and he said, and shampoo. Because yeah. <laughs> apparently in his backpack he had shampoo, but he kind of giggled and, and the, the crown kind of like, you know, challenged him like, that's not – like, do you think this is funny? Because he kind of chuckled after he said like, and shampoo. But my thing yeah. when I heard that is like, does he not realize that, you know, if you were planning to kill someone, maybe you'd want to wash up afterwards. And maybe it would right. make sense to have shampoo. Like I thought, yeah. you know, the shampoo, almost when he listed the stuff, why didn't he say you had a hat – a knife, a hatchet, and shampoo. Like, what the, what the yeah. heck was he planning to do? <laughs> That's a good point. I never thought about that. I just, yeah. I, I as well thought it was a kind of a funny thing. I understood why he was laughing at it. He actually replies to them after, after they, after the, um, the, the crown says, is this funny to you? He says, no, it's not funny. I don't understand why you keep suggesting otherwise. Yeah. Which and is a I strange thing to say. Yeah, well, I can picture that from the interrogation video. Like, just the way he he acts there, he was so matter-of-fact and cold. He, yeah. the, the way he was answering the questions of the interrogator, in the middle, during the interrogation, at one of, the, like, this super heated moment, she's, like, leaning over the table, like, you murdered these people and we know you did it. He interrupts right. her by saying, how old are you? And the, yeah. the, the interrogator's like, what? And he's like, I'm just, what's your age? 
Mm-hmm. And she answers it, and he asks how long she's been a cop. And it's just yeah. like this bizarre little interaction. And oh. this is this is kind of like that. And, you know, I could just picture the way he says something, and then he just has this kind of awkward laugh at the end of every sentence. So, yeah, yeah. He is socially awkward. I mean, it's, it's documented through his, his entire life. That's why he's kind of going into this world. They say escaping into this world, but it's more like just immersing into a world that he can understand in my mind. I mean, I have a lot mm-hmm. of friends who play a lot of video games. We all do. Um, my kids love them too. It's it's a, it's it's not so much just getting away from reality. It's it's stepping into another one with a new perspective, and you know, it's it's kind of nice to to be somebody else, especially all, for uh, for a guy like this. Yeah, it's also a big distraction. If you're not happy yes. with your life and you're miserable, and your parents are on your case about getting a job, and you have all this pressure, you can turn on Skyrim, and all of a sudden you're like you know, in another world where your problems have no relevance and you have a thousand things you got to do to save the world and you just find yourself, you know, just like that. That's what I like about video games. It's it's some people get lost in alcohol or drugs and they forget about their job and their problems with that. Video games can do the same thing. But also, like we see in Rocky Rambo's story, you can get lost in them too, just like like you can in you know scratch tickets or whatever else, uh, whatever other advice you find. But at at this point in the story, where we're at now is basically present day. Like what's happened is shortly after this cro- cross examination, the judge announces that they'll deliver a verdict on April third. So we're recording this late February. So we're we're a month out from over a month out from this verdict coming through. Rocky Rambo Wayne Nam Cam, now 27, displayed a complete lack of empathy, Crown said, in the final day of closing arguments. Mulligan told the court Cam has not been diagnosed with a mental or internet gaming disorder, adding the murders were carried out in a controlled and methodical manner, planned and deliberate with execution-style injury. Therefore, Cam should be convicted on two counts of first-degree murder. Cam had been consumed by violent video games for much of his life. Defense counsel Glenn Orris says Cam thought he was in a video game when he slashed Jones, 68, who used a walker more than a hundred times and cut the throat of Ma Jones, 64, in the couple's home in September 2017. On Tuesday, defense closed its case, saying the appropriate verdict is manslaughter because Crown has not proven murder beyond a reasonable doubt. Madam Justice Giroux will deliver her verdict on April 3rd. I wasn't there in the courtroom, but I am definitely leaning towards a guilty verdict in this case. Him buying the stuff, yeah, him buying the stuff in advance, that is just too much for me. That alone, like that shows premeditation. The th- the thing for me is is you know if this if he's lost in a video game when he's buying the hatchet and and all that stuff for, uh, the gloves and all that from the Canadian Tire, obviously he's planning for this. Is he not in that gaming consciousness state right there? Why isn't he just hatcheting people in in the, in the uh, out in the parking lot or or the cashier? The reason why he's not doing it is because it's not a safe spot to do it. It's safe when he's in a house with two senior citizens. And that's not a gaming consciousness. That's not out of his mind. That's his fantasy being in a safe place for him to play out. Yeah. Right. It's, 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 he has privacy in there to do like in their house. He has privacy. They, they may fight back a little bit, but he's got them where he wants them to do his thing. Mm -hmm. And there, there's something he says that to me is very, um, very telling. One of the things he, he said when on the stand when being ac- when being asked, you know, why he did a lot of the things, why did you buy this? Why did you go in the house? One of the things he said was, um, oh, where is it? He says, like I said, I don't think I killed Mr. and Mrs. Jones. I never feel any feelings. Like I don't sleep at night. I don't feel guilt or any sadness or happiness. I don't know how to describe it. And to me, like that little sentence is kind of yeah. describing someone who just has no empathy uh-huh. And, you know, and if you have no empathy, you're capable of anything. Right. So you're talking about a sociopath, maybe even a psychopath, right? I mean, that's all he's really saying. He, cause he, <laughs> here's the thing with everything, man. It it's t- happens to, uh, see, I'm from the land of uh, Vincent Lee, 45 minutes away from me. I drive past it all the time when I go do grocery, go get groceries 
in a bigger town near my small town where the Greyhound bus beheading happened with Vincent Lee, now known as Will Baker. And oftentimes, not just with that case, but with many cases when when mental illness or these excuses like a gaming consciousness comes into play, it's like just because you have an explanation doesn't mean you have an excuse. Mm-hmm. And my fear is that we're going to get another excuse in this verdict. I'm all up. I understand that there, there's mental illness out there and people can be taken over by it and they can commit crazy acts like cutting a kid's head off on a Greyhound bus and eating parts of them and all that. I mean, I guess I understand that. What I don't, what I hope doesn't happen here is the same thing that kind of happened out here is that in a decade from now, we're going to learn that uh, Rocky Rambo's back online. I, I don't think it's going to turn out that way. I don't see it turning out that way. He reminds me of Rocky Rambo in, in listening to his interrogation. Now, I don't mean to like reference my own stuff, but d- did you listen to the episodes that I did where I interviewed Lindsay Suvonaroth? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course. Some, some of the things from the interrogation, it reminded me a bit of that. Like she also was super cold and mm-hmm. awkward and like and was addicted to video games and like I couldn't help but as I was listening to this story and watching that interrogation I couldn't help but seeing a few similarities like I think right. there are I think there are people out there who just have like you know psychopaths or whatnot where they just have no empathy yeah. and they can you know they can just go down these crazy dark rabbit holes and you know, and, and pop out every so often and do something like this. Sure. And, you know, that's what, that's what I think happened. I think this guy knows exactly what he did and he's just not up for telling anybody how he feels about it. That That's my opinion. I think he's, I think, it's my, I think the, the crown's got it bang on. Me too. Me, I hope so. I hope so. It's a, it's a strange world we live in right now. I, I, I will, I will, I mean, we're not placing bets here, but I'll just, We'll talk to each other in about a decade, man, and and I think that it won't be what you think it is. I think that he'll, I think he'll be out in ten years. I think that well, they'll find a way. I hope not. Th- yeah, the the thing is though, like, I don't. It, it's tough. No, there's no way around the fact. Like in my opinion, he's. I think he did it, and I think he knows what he did. But at the same time, I think whatever made him do it and is making him hide it is some kind of illness, and. Yeah, and it's a complicated situation on how you deal with that. Just like the bus beheading, that person who did that wasn't making like a logical, strategic decision to do this for you know for their own gain or something. If if science and medicine can help those people, you know, and and can identify what's going on, it's it's a very complicated situation and well, yeah you know, well and- it's very much so but here here's i mean we could go on forever about this but my thing with with the vincent lee situation with the greyhound bus beheading is that a lot of people are paranoid schizophrenics and a lot of people have voices in their minds but not everybody just the same as people who have bad childhoods and were abused and all that don't all become killers or serial killers not all paranoid schizophrenics that walk into the sun thinking god's talking to them end up on a, on, end up on a greyhound bus kit, cutting a kid's head off my my thing is like you need to put them in a different category you know you don't want to paint the brush that all people with mental illness are capable of murder obviously but the ones who have committed murder let's pay a little bit more attention to them and put some you know guidelines in place to make sure they're getting their medication down the line and for example with vincent lee from what i've heard and what i've read he doesn't even need to check in that's 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 scary but uh, yeah, it's it's such a big issue, especially here in Canada, because like I get that people with mental illness fall to can fall through the cracks. There's not enough money to look after anybody, let alone the mentally ill. So it's it's such a complicated, big issue. Like my opinion is what we should do is raise taxes by like two or three percent and put a ton of money into education, the school system, healthcare, you know, I just don't think there's enough money to make everything work. And people have such, 
high expectations from a country like Canada or the United States for the government to be able to manage things. But at the same time, the average person wants tax rates <laughs> to, to drop and doesn't want to pay property tax and, you know, and wants everything convenient and easy. And it's just you can't have it all. I If, if a government ran on the platform that we're going to raise taxes 3% and every bit of that is going to go towards education and health care and looking after the vulnerable and filling these cracks that people fall through. One, uh, I, for one, I'd vote for them. And a second thing is I'm sure a lot of that money would go towards helping people with mental illness who have a risk of harming themselves and others and, you know, and Absolutely. trying to mitigate that. But anyway, I'm all, I'm all, yeah, it's, it's a long story. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my end with this is that you have to have the person with the issue come to those services and take advantage of them. If they're hiding in their own mind, like, a, like a, I keep on call, thinking in my head, Rocky raccoon, that Beatles song, uh, Rocky Rambo, or like a Vincent Lee, they have to come to the service. So That's you true. have outliers. You have outliers, right? And and my thing is like, if you have these outliers and these people who commit these acts and sure, mentally ill, whatever you want to call it, you got to, let's just stay, let's put them in a little bit of a different group and let's like stay on top of them as time goes on and ensure that uh, this doesn't happen again. I'm all up for second chances and giving people the benefit of the doubt and all that. Um, but I, at the end of the day, all I can think about is the families of these people and them themselves. Often, you never get to hear the victim side because they're dead. And uh, I know if it was me who walked into the room after having a rum and coke and just heard my wife yelp out and I got stabbed 103 times, if I could speak back from the afterlife, I'd be like, hey, could you not give this guy, <laughs> could, you, could you just lock him up at least? Do you see what he did to me? What just hit me is it just uh, kind of it's kind of an interesting thing is we're talking about if there was more money and more resources and services that maybe people like if Rocky Rambo is in fact mentally ill, maybe people like that would, you know, get better help and better access to care to prevent things like this. But at the same right. time, think of Diana Ma Jones. She was working in kind of that industry to help people. She was probably working for an underfunded kind of department or to a business that was just scraping by. She probably wasn't paid nearly enough for what she was doing. And she was someone who was kind of fighting to make the system work. Again, improvising devices to help these people who had special needs. So it's kind of like th the world that we're describing may prevent this. She was almost like helping fight to make that a reality. So it's kind of very sad. Yeah, That's and that way it's 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 connected. And and also with her, I bet you she wasn't paid enough. She was probably working her ass off over time to, you know, meet the demands of her clients. At the same time, then she would go she would leave work, get groceries and go home to a 68-year-old husband who right. also needed care and to end up the victim of a murder that's as pointless and senseless. And then be, to have your life snuffed out by someone as pathetic as, you know, Rocky Rambo, it's, this is a, a sad story. And we can, we can talk a lot about the, the elements that made this happen and, and that, but at the end of it, it's a, a very tragic story that could happen to anyone listening's grandparents. You know, it, it's, it's like they were hit by lightning, except it was much more complicated than that. Much more. You're working hard on all your various podcasts. What's the, what's in the boil? What's on the stove? Um, weekly, I do a podcast called Crime Machine. I already talked about it. Um, I have a couple more projects coming down the line. The 911 calls uh, with the operator that will be. It's already been out on my feed, but it'll be out soon. And then I have another one called Subhuman, and I have a real uh, another talent coming out. Um, it's going to be called Crime Carnival. So, but mainly if you follow me on Crime Machine, you'll be able to, to see everything else that I'm trying to do here. I'm Canadian too. I got to keep on saying that I'm Canadian. My audience <laughs> is like 95% American. Nobody seems to know I'm Canadian. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure, a real, a real pleasure to be, to be invited on your show. This, this is just fun for me, man, what, what we're doing here. I want to thank you for joining Jack Luna and I in this discussion surrounding the bizarre story of Rocky Rambo Wayne Cam. 
As the decision of this case is expected early April, I plan to provide an update at that time, either in the form of a follow-up episode or simply via my social media accounts. So follow me there. But if you really want to stay up to date with this case, I suggest following the Global News senior reporter, Romina Dea. You've already heard some excerpts of her reporting during this episode. I'll add a link to her Twitter account in the episode notes. And with that, we'll end this episode of Nighttime. But before we part, I want to give some thanks. First, a huge thank you to our guest, Jack Luna, for joining me. Jack, you're truly one of the best, pal. And now for anyone out there who wants more Nighttime, let me suggest the premium feed. For about the price of a cup of coffee, you can access ad-free early releases of the episodes, as well as the Nightcap After Show, in which I and a guest climb a bit deeper down the rabbit hole. You can access the premium feed by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, I want to thank the new members to the group, Nicholas, Doug, Devin, and Ian. Thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, but can't pitch in financially, you can simply give me a hand by telling your friends about me and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or an equivalent. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on and off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. And I'm also on YouTube and becoming active there. If you have any story ideas or want to give feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. Now, until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.